Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and students. Um, welcome to, to the American University of Armenia. Welcome uh, to this event. Uh, my name is Vaharam Termatovesen. I'm the chair of Political Science and International Affairs Program. Um, today we have an interesting uh, event. And in about two weeks, uh, the Republic of Armenia will celebrate its 28th anniversary of independence. For the past three decades, several topics have occupied Armenia's national agenda. Armenia, Armenians were able to cope with some of them. However, much more needs to be done to deal both with the remaining problems and emerging ones. One of the issues that kept our national agenda busy was the relations with the diaspora. There have been six Armenian diaspora conferences. In 2008, the Ministry of Diaspora was established, which after 11 years was transformed into a new institution as Prime Minister of Armenia appointed High Commissioner of Diaspora Affairs. For a long time, the journey of mutual discovery followed a seniors trail. For too long, we resorted to dilatory tactics. An eclectic mix of approaches, frantic attempts, didn't help much to surmount existing issues. With a new government in power, there have been a new wave of expectations placed on the diaspora, like massive repatriation, using diaspora human resources to develop Armenia's economy, including them in political and administrative reforms. After all, nowadays there are more questions concerning Armenian diaspora relations than a decade ago. Yes, we know the diaspora better than a decade ago, two decades ago, but is the knowledge that Armenian state institutions and society possess enough for informed decisions and collaboration? How well is Armenia's political, political, social, and economic problems known in the diaspora? What do we mean by a diaspora? Do traditional Armenian community institutions, parties, church, schools, keep up with technological changes? What about the new diaspora? Are we heading towards the right direction? Have we even identified these directions or direct the direction? Do we need to identify them? Are we discussing Armenian diaspora relations from the right standpoint? Have we put it in the right context or framework? Have we considered the myriad of circumstances that play a vital role in building effective formulas of cooperation? Are we able to prognosticate the future of the relations? To discuss these and other relevant questions, we have High Commissioner of Diaspora Affairs of Armenia, Mr. Zarev Sinanyan, with us today. Mr. Zarev Sinanyan was born in Yerevan, in Armenia, in 1973. In 1998, he and his family emigrated to the United States and settled in Bourbon, California. Sinanyan, um, Zarev Sinanyan attended the John Moore Middle School in Burbank and went on to graduate from Bourbon High School. In 1997, he earned a bachelor's degree in political science and history, and in 1997, at the, at the University of California, he earned that degree in Los Angeles. He then attended the law school at the University of Southern California, where he obtained his Juris Doctor, while in law school, Sinanian worked um, for the United States Securities and Exchange Commission and intended, interned for Justice Earl Johnson at the California Court of Appeal. After his graduation from law school, he entered civil litigation service and ran his own law office. In April, 19, in April 2014, Sinanyan was appointed mayor of Glendale, California. Prior to being appointed mayor, he won election as a city councilman and held posts in various commissions, including parks, recreation and community service, and the community development block grant advisory committee. This year, on June 14th, he was appointed High Commissioner of Diaspora Affairs of Armenia, serving under Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. We also, um, uh, Narek Mukhrishchan will be also moderating this event. Let me briefly also introduce Narek Mukhrishchan. He works as a, a visiting lecturer at the College of Humanities and Social Sciences at the American University of Armenia. He studied world history at the Yerevan State University in political science and international affairs at the American University of Armenia. He holds MA in World History, Political Science and International Affairs. He has PhD in World History. And uh, last year on, on December 9th, 
and Narek Mukeshan was elected as a member of the National Assembly. Um, Narek, what is yours? Thank you for introduction, dear uh, guest, dear AUA community. Uh, before Zara Sinanian's speech, I would like to say a couple of words about initiative for, for small state studies uh, that were started uh, with the work with the uh, University of Iceland, where one of the prominent centers for small state studies is located. So the great idea uh, behind the small state studies is in Armenia is to conceptualize the smallness of Armenia, to define Armenia as a small state. This is the first event uh, after our inaugural workshop took place in May, uh, during which we uh, put an emphasis on research directions uh, under the Initiative for Small State Studies in AUA. The four research uh, directions are uh, high technologies, institutions, security, and of course diaspora. Diaspora is one of the unique characteristics to study Armenia. Diaspora is one of the unique forces, social, economic, and political forces, you know, which can help us to compensate the smallness of Armenia internationally. So, starting from this semester, uh, we, are, we aim to organize different lecture series, seminars, public talks by diplomats, experts, scholars, politicians, and uh, during our inaugural workshop in May, we put into circulation two concepts for Armenia. Armenia is a smart nation, small but smart, and small state and global nation. So, dear High Commissioner, you are the first to talk in this format uh, about the smallness in Armenia and about the globalness of Armenia. Dear Zara the floor is yours. After the speech, your speech will open a Q&A session and uh, we'll have a discussion. Please. Good evening, everyone. Dear faculty and, and students, dear guests, thank you for this opportunity to have a, hopefully a frank conversation with you about um, our status, in essence. And our status is very much encapsulated by that expression, I believe. Small state, global nation. Because that's what we are. And what does that mean? What does that do for us? Is that a, a strength? Is that a weakness? Does it matter? Do we fully exploit the opportunities that our status as a global nation has afforded us? I think these are things that we need to think about and think about uh, more systemically and think about more frequently because uh, this is our reality. So let's start with our reality. Who are we? The Republic of Armenia is a uh, land mass that's populated by its indigenous people mostly, we have some minorities, but mostly populated by its indigenous people. Uh, and uh, that land mass only uh, consists of approximately 10 to 15 percent of its historic territory. So the, the, the historic area of the Armenian people is mostly not inhabited by Armenians, uh, but what we have retained is a territory called Armenia that's Administratively, administratively composed of two entities, the Republic of Armenia and the Republic of Artsakh. It's a landlocked country. It's a country that has two belligerent and hostile neighbors to the west and to the east. Has uh, a somewhat of a friendly, sometimes ambivalent neighbor to the south. And uh, again, a somewhat of a friendly but uh, also conflicted neighbor to the north. The population of the country of, of Armenia is probably known only to God. <laughs> no one has any certain statistic information, but we can estimate that it's somewhere between two and a half and three million people. Um, our density, population density, is not very high if you compare it to comparable size countries in Europe that have in excess of 10 million people living on similar territory. In fact, if we include the territory of, uh, of uh, Republic of Artsakh and the liberated territory, we're, we're talking about not the 28,000 
900 square kilometers that we inherited from the Soviet Socialist Republic of Armenia, but I believe somewhere around 42,000 square kilometers, which is I'm, I'm very bad at math, but some something like a 50% increase in our land mass. So there's there's some land. We're small, but we're not that small. Um, but that's not the end of it, right? Then we have uh, the diaspora. Uh, diaspora is this entity, you know, I think some of the, the questions that are already posed are, are quite poignant, because what is the diaspora? What does that mean? How many diasporas are there? Uh, and these are all open to uh, discussion as well. We have Armenians, in essence, living outside of their uh, ancestral homeland, uh, sometimes Armenians that live simply outside of the territory of the Republic of Armenia, but still on their ancestral homeland. And they represent uh, a potential source of knowledge, information, wealth, that I believe has been largely underutilized over the last 30 years of independence. Now, Let's go back to the questions that you had posed. What is the diaspora? And is there one? Uh, I think any one of us has, that has ever associated with any diaspora can quite certainly tell you that there is no such thing as one diaspora. There is the concept of diaspora, but then there are numerous communities that are very different from one another and have only basically their Armenian ancestry that unites them. And I'm not talking about the difference between the Russian diaspora and the French diaspora, I mean, Russian Armenian diaspora, French Armenian diaspora, and the US Armenian diaspora. I'm talking about differences within the states. For example, the diaspora that's in Moscow is qualitatively different from the diaspora that's in the south, southern parts of Russia, so, so Krasnodar and, and uh, Stavrovsk regions. They're different by their composition, they're different by their etymology, they're different by their history, they're different by their social structure, political structure. Uh, even uh, some of these communities are very urban, others are very agrarian. So the differences are there even within Russia. I'm, I'm not even going to talk about the Armenians that live in the Ural area or in the Far East because there are uh, quite a significant number of them living there. And this is not very unique for Russia. If you look at the US, for example, the uh, Los Angeles community is quite different from that in San Diego. And, and these, the, the, you know, the distances are marginal, they're not that much. The community that resides in Sacramento is entirely different. Perhaps the most striking, strikingly unique community on the west coast of the US are the Fresno Armenians, who are, uh, for the most part, descendants of genocide survivors and or farmers, uh, hereditary farmers, and uh, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very different from Los Angeles Armenian community. And we can go on like this, analyzing pretty much every community that's out there. Um, so how do we deal with that? Do we deal with that or do we just say, okay, well, you know, fine, good for them, they're diaspora, they live there and move on. In the first 25, 30 years of, the, uh, of Armenia's independence, I think there was a pretty clear model of uh, Armenian Republic's uh, relationship with, with its diaspora. First and foremost, and this is pretty much caused by the earthquake and then the ensuing uh, Armenian liberation struggle in Artsakh, it was one of, okay, we have a common goal, we need to rebuild uh, or deal with the consequences of the earthquake, and diaspora had its role in it. It played a significant role, I think, to this day, since we haven't eliminated all the impacts of the, of the earthquake, they're still playing a role. With respect to the Artsakh and then the liberation struggle, diaspora didn't contribute a large number of soldiers or volunteers, but it did contribute financially and, and otherwise uh, to bring about a common goal of uh, liberating uh, part of our homeland. But then the relationship kind of shifted uh, and the model basically was, you know, 
you want to do something for Armenia, contribute some money. Here's Armenia Fund, or here's this project, here's that project. You want to do a good deed, give the money, and be quiet. Uh, this was a very typical approach, you know, the, the second part of it. You know, you, you don't get to talk, you don't get to have your input. Um, I don't think any Armenian particularly felt welcomed uh, to come to Armenia and engage in some professional um, services or joining the government. We can look statistically what happened, right? In 1991, when Armenia declared independence, there were several diaspora Armenians that were included in the government. Most prominent of them, probably Rafi Obamesian, first the, first the foreign minister. Jiragi Baritian was the advisor to the president, the national security advisor to the president. I think at some point he was deputy foreign minister. Artan Moskanyan was deputy foreign minister. Uh, Sefu Tashian was energy minister, if I'm not mistaken. There were other mid-ranked and, and lower rank, rank diasporans in the government. If you fast forward to 2015, there were none. None. So the relationship, instead of progressing towards more engagement, more involvement from the diaspora, uh, closer cooperation had regressed into one of complete isolation from one another. Again, the diaspora still came to Armenia. They visited Yerevan. They loved it. They partied. They went to Garni, Gelar, Dechniatsin, did their thing, and then went back. Um, and this is what the new Republic of Armenia, the new government of the Republic of Armenia inherited from the, the past one. This broken, insincere relationship where diaspora is expected to donate and give money and not participate. And it was somewhat insincere on the other side too, because diasporans came, prominent diasporas came, they met with the government officials, they received medals from them, posed with them, took photos, and then went back home and, and complained to the entire world about how corrupt the government is and how awful it is and how no one should work with them. So there's plenty of blame to go around, and I want to make, make sure I'm fair to everyone. Diaspora played its unfortunate role in perpetuating the corrupt government in the Republic of Armenia. And in order for diaspora to sort of straighten its own back, and realize its full wealth and potential vis-a-vis -vis Armenia, they need to realize this, and they need to understand that in the future they cannot proceed in the same manner. If, God forbid, it comes to that, that this new government starts regressing and degenerating into something that it was meant to be, I would expect diaspora to be very frank, be very honest, and be very brutal in their evaluation of how bad or how well things are going. So that's kind of the past. What do we do in the future? How do we bring some health, uh, bring some sincerity, bring some constructiveness into this relationship? I believe that we have an enormous opportunity in our diaspora. We have enormous resources, basically limitless. Uh, maybe the financial resources are limited, but the human resource isn't. Today. There is a shortage of virtually every type of professional in the Republic of Armenia, from governmental sectors to the uh, free market economy. And that vacuum is easily filled if we can tap into that resource that diaspora represents for Armenia. And we don't need to recreate the wheel. We don't need to come up with some strange answers to some very complicated questions. All we need to do is just look at others who have done this, and done this very successfully. And of course, one country that comes to mind is Israel. This country has, well, in fact, this country was founded by uh, diasporan Jews, because if you look, at, look back at 1915 or 1910, pre-World War I, the, pop the Jewish population of uh, uh, Palestine, what is now Israel, was something near 100,000 people. Today, the population of the state of Israel is 8.5 million people. Of those, approximately 6.5 are actually Jews. So, if you want to look at a successful model of 
engaging a diaspora community to actually create something out of almost nothing, a recreate um, a language that was almost dead. You know, Yiddish was much more popular than Hebrew was before the creation of the State of Israel. Israel presents a fantastic example for us. So I'm taking a page from my own lecture. <laughs> And uh, thankfully, I have two invitations from the state of Israel to go and study their experience. And both offers I've taken up with great pleasure because there's a lot to be learned there. Um, what are we doing right now at the Office of the High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs? Well, first and foremost, we're trying to study the diaspora, trying to understand who are we dealing with. It seems like a silly question, but we really don't understand, we don't know the diaspora that well. We don't have a good map of the diaspora. We know conceptually, we have sort of rough ideas, we, we know the major players, we know who the wealthy people are because the previous government concentrated on the wealthy people and on the wealth and dealt with them directly, not really dealing with the communities themselves. Uh, we need to understand the communities because Every layer of our diaspora is essential to the state of Armenia, including the wealthy. But the ordinary people are just as important, are just as interesting for us. So we're studying the diaspora, and that's happening in a couple of ways. One is by visiting the diaspora, and actually visiting not, not to, again, meet with these wealthy or the community people, but actually meeting with our compatriots who reside there, all kinds of compatriots, people who are very cognizant of the fact that they're Armenian, people who aren't, people who speak Armenian, people who don't speak Armenian, people who are um, marginally Armenian, as some would call them, but uh, have that light in them, and we want to sort of um, stroke that fire in them and make sure that they understand that uh, the homeland that we have belongs to all of us. The second method is something that our Prime Minister is very interested in, is actually mapping the diaspora, which is an exercise that's probably going to take some significant amount of time and resource. And what does that mean? We, we want to create a database of our human resource to know now we can't, you know, we can't include every human being, every Armenian in that uh, database it would be silly and unnecessary and probably impossible. But we do want to create a, a, a usable database which contains the names and easy access to you know, contact information for every person that represents an asset, that represents a resource for, for the Republic of Armenia. Um, we're well on the, on the way to starting this process. And I tell you, sound, you, know, you, may, you may say, well, well on the way to start the process. It takes a lot. I mean, you have to have the proper platform, you have to have the right strategy, you have to approach the question from several angles, you know, consolidate numerous lists, actually research them, data mine them. So again, this is going to take a while, it's not going to be easy, but it has to be done because all we have is our people. That's all we have. You know, over the last 30 years, how many times have you heard public officials say, we don't have resources, we don't have natural wealth, we don't have oil, we don't have gas, but we have our people. Well, not knowing who those people are, where they live, what they do is kind of useless. I mean, you can say, we have our people, but what does that do for the state? Not much. So we want to reverse that process. We want to make sure that um, we can actually quantify this resource and we can actually easily access the resource when the time comes. What are the goals of the uh, Office of the High Commissioner? It's a dual goal. And I'll start with the but-for goal. The but-for goal is that goal without which you can't achieve anything else. And that's the strengthening of the state of Armenia. The state of Armenia is that pivotal component of the Armenia diaspora relationship without which the diaspora can't survive. In order for the diaspora to be strong, in order for the diaspora to survive, we have to have a strong Republic of Armenia. The Republic of Armenia is a 
is a centrifugal force. It's, it's like the sun around which the communities revolve. If that sun is, you know, the light is going out, if it's fizzling out, planets are going to twirl out of control. They're going to lose their orbit, and we're going to lose them. And literally, that's what's happening now. Literally. If you hear the complaints about, oh, the Russian Armenian community is diluting, it's, it's, it's dissolving, it's losing its identity, it's um, not, not only just acculturating, but also assimilating into larger Russian society. Well, that's exactly what's happening. It's because the Republic of Armenia doesn't present that uh, magnetic strength, that force, that brand around which our communities can revolve. It's a very understandable and normal human thing to do, especially for young people. Young people want fresh, progressive, interesting, um, I hate using this word, but it kind of, you, know, you, you, can't, you can't replace it. It's a, they want a sexy concept. And you can't have that, those things, in a state that's corrupt, in a state that's regressive, in a state that's close-minded, uh, in a state that uh, doesn't really represent those values that it purports to do. So, the idea is we fix our home, we fix our house, we fix the Republic of Armenia, we make it a country of justice. I think that's very important, having a, a just, um, you know, judiciary, having a functioning judiciary is very important to our people. Our people have proven time and time again that they will vote with their, with their feet. They will leave Armenia if they can't live in a just society. And justice doesn't just mean justice in courts, it means economic justice, it means moral justice. A lot of the people that were leaving Armenia in the last 10, 15 years were not people that were want of needs, uh, you know, that they were want of resources. They had money, they had, they had a pretty good life, but when they were thinking, well, yeah, but do I want my child to grow up in a society where there's no justice system, you can't rely on the courts, you can't prove yourself to be right when the time comes, and that was very demoralizing, people were leaving. So we want to create a country that provides good health care for people. That's very important. Again, it's a very basic need. People understand that certain medical procedures are available in countries that are not too far from Armenia. And immediately, you know, they, they, want, they want good medical services. And it, that comes with having a progressive, strong, economically viable country. So that's a very major, very important goal for us to achieve. People want a good education system. They want their children to have good education. People invest their future in their children. They see their lives being perpetuated in their children. So therefore, they want their children to succeed. And having a good education is a very, very important component for them. Any diaspora that is repatriating, especially from the West, I assure you, one of the first things they ask is, what do I do with my kids? Where do I send them to school? Can, we, can I send them to a good school where they get a good education? and they can end up going to a um, good university. Very important issue to settle. Economic justice, I've kind of allured to it, and I'll you know, accentuate that a little more. What we had in the past, which was monopolization of the economy, was very detrimental, not only to the development of the country as large, but also to the ability of a, of a human being to realize themselves. To, to fully use their potential and say that, you know, I've succeeded in life. Uh, folks were cut out of the system. Folks had no room in the system. The same people that left Armenia because of the unfair economic conditions ended up succeeding wildly outside of Armenia. So there's nothing wrong with the people itself. It's the system that's problematic. And you can take this comparison to anything else, right? You, the same people that refused to put on their seatbelt in Yerevan, <coughs> They move to, to the United States and within two days they're, they're putting on their belts without ever complaining. The same people that, let's say, would avoid paying taxes in Armenia, pay all their taxes in the West. Because the system is set up in such a way where uh, not only the consequences of not abiding by the laws are uh, very, very high, but 
also you you kind of don't want to be different than anyone else. You you do what everyone else does, which is abide by the rules, abide by the laws, and you ultimately realize that everyone abiding by the laws is to, to everyone else, every every individual's benefit. Everyone benefits from it. So you want to create a brand that is Armenia, that's attractive to people, that's attractive, that, that makes people want to associate with it. If you're a child in uh, Argentina and your parents are forcing you to study Spanish, or I'm sorry, study, or study Armenian after your daily Spanish lessons, then you're, you know, if you're wondering why, why? Why am I studying Armenian? All my friends don't speak Armenian, I don't need it. And I, and I gotta do what, two, or two more hours of homework to study some language that associated with, with what? But if that child knows that that language is associated with something strong, something that's viable, something that's attractive, something that people respect when they hear the name, it's a very different approach. Same with uh, what's happening you know, in Russia. Similar way, people are sending their kids to Russian schools and don't insist on their kids speaking Armenian is because they simply don't see any value for their children to tie their future to Armenian. That's why it's happening. I recently returned uh, from Russia, my, my first official trip, and prior to, to going there, I was told very sort of negative and dark. Stories and uh, painted a very dark picture about what's happening in the Russian Armenian community. Frankly, going there, I only went to to Moscow. So, for, to be fair, I haven't seen the rest of it yet. But in Moscow, on about second, third day of meeting with the community in various groups and various layers of society, I was convinced. I was convinced the only reason they have the problems that they have is because of the vacuum that the Republic of Armenia has created there. No leadership no direction, no common ideology, no understanding of where we're going, are we going together, we're going, we're going taking their own paths. And as a result, you have a community that's very divisive, a community that doesn't see any value in investing in, in the Armenian future for their children. And it's very ironic because physically, it's community that's the closest to the Republic of Armenia, you would think that they would have the easiest time to retain their identity. You know, coming to Yerevan from most of Russia, I'm not talking about the Far East, but coming to Armenia from most of Russia is not nearly as difficult as coming from the western coast of the United States or from Argentina or from Chile or from Venezuela. But some of these communities, you know, community in Uruguay is much more stuck to its ethnic identity than the Russian Armenian community. So, again, the onus falls on the government to get its act together, to create those preconditions that are going to provide for the opportunity for people to strongly identify with their state and with their ethnicity and with uh, constituent components of that, one of which is the language. Although it's not an absolute must to speak the language, I believe, to be fully Armenian. What's the ultimate goal? And this is a sort of a discussion that we're having now with uh, some of the Armenian parliament members. Do we want, we want repatriation, so let's get that out of the way. Of course, we want repatriation, we want mass repatriation. That doesn't mean that we want every diaspora to come to Armenia. That's just realistically not going to happen. And we probably don't want it either, because having a diaspora again is an asset. People who are living in, for example, power centers like Russia or the United States or France, and having a community there has significance, it has a purpose. But we must have a critical mass of population in Armenia. We, we can't expect that in the next 50 years we can continue with two and a half or three million people and have a future. You have to have a critical mass of people, especially when your hostile neighbors the one to the west has 80 million people. And your other hostile neighbor to the east has 9 million people. Again, going back to Israel, they've had a very deliberate and very systematic approach to repatriation. The concept of Aliyah, bringing people in in mass, 
using every opportunity. If you look back, every um, force majeure situation that they've had, in, especially in the Middle East or in Africa, they've used to repatriate Jews. Within my lifetime, I remember the Ethiopian Jews being flown in uh, from Addis and other parts of Ethiopia in mass uh, in, in 91, I think, when Haile Selassie was, uh, Haile de Mariam was dethroned and the, the Eritreans took over Addis Ababa. And more than that, again, somehow the population of Israel got to the point of 8.5 million people. Obviously, they've had a program. Even in Paris, every time there's been an attack on a synagogue, and the state of Israel encourages uh, repatriation, and a lot of Jews respond. Because they know that when they come to Israel, they're going to be, there's going to be an entire program to greet them, to assimilate them, to help them acculturate, to help them feel at home. We need to create those, those conditions. We have history of repatriation. I think we can you know, look back at history. And uh, as early as 19th century, when the Russian troops liberated Yerevan and Nakhchivan Khanates from uh, the Persian Empire, the Iraqi from Iran, there wasn't a population exchange. So the former Nakhchevani and Ararat Valley Armenians that were forcefully deported to uh, Persia were allowed to come back after about 200 years of living there. And and some uh, Persians, ethnic Persians or ethnic Muslims were exchanged in return to go to Persia. After the genocide, when uh, a communist Bolsheviks took over Armenia, fortunately there were people there were good Bolsheviks sometimes. There were some Bolsheviks came to power, like Masnikan and his crew, who realized that what they had in Armenia wasn't sufficient to create the Armenia that they wanted to see. And what, what do they do? They turn to the diaspora, the Russian diaspora, Krasnodar area, those areas around Rostov, where there was a significant Armenian population. There were also some survivors from the genocide that had gotten there. They turned to the West and they repatriated key people. Now, they weren't just going for mass. They were going at professionals, academicians, cultural folks, and as a result, you had people like everyone from Tamanyan to Abed uh, Kisakan to uh, many, many, you know, Racha Nersisyan, you know, every actor came from either Tiflis, Baku, or Istanbul. Every scientist, every linguist that you know came from Istanbul. The irony of life, right? The Armenians complain about the, the linguistic reforms that were made during the Soviet period, and the linguists were, I think, the, the two famous linguists were both both sides, so they were Armenians, and uh, so on and so forth. Scientists all came from Russia, so there was a major influx of uh, brain power instead of brain drain. A major influx of brain power for the scope of Armenia back then, which gave life to Armenia. 1941, when 45, 46, 47, 48, when Armenia had suffered some significant uh, population losses in World War II, and also when uh, Soviet Union had some serious intentions of liberating uh, some territories in Eastern Armenia, Karsan, Ardahan, and uniting at least part of them to the Republic, Soviet Republic of Armenia, there was a repatriation that was organized. You had the number is around 130 or 140,000 people that came from all over the world, from everywhere from the US to France, but mostly from the Middle East, Greece, and then Syria, uh, Lebanon. My dad came uh, as part of that wave. And uh, those people were different. You know, they came and they brought new life and a new kind of uh, outlook to Armenia. And even uh, as, a, as a kid, I remember that we, you know, I traveled a lot to Russia when I was a kid. But I remember that we were very different in Armenia because we had a lot of Western exposure. And the reason we had that was because, you know, 15, 20 percent of the population had relatives living in the West. So we, we, we were much more cognizant of what was going on in the West. We, were, we dressed differently. We ate differently. We distrusted the state much differently. You know, in the 80s, very, very, very few people took the whole communist ideology very seriously. That's because they had major cultural influence from the diaspora through its own <coughs> repatriates. But sometimes this, this repatriation was done in a very wrong way. What we want to do is avoid that. For example, the 46 repatriation 
was not very well thought out. I think the, the math was that, hey, they're going to they're gonna come, Goddess is going to be liberated, we're going to expel a lot of Kurds and, and Turks from that area, we'll just dump them there and they'll live there happily in Goddess and the surrounding villages. Well, that didn't happen. So people came, boatloads of them, you know, they would come with boat to uh, some seaport on the Black Sea and they would put them on the trains, travel them to, and get them to, uh, not Yerevan, they would get them to rural areas. But a lot of these folks were coming from Beirut, from Istanbul, from Damascus, and they, they really didn't know rural life. So 90% of them ended up in, uh, in Yerevan. And the country simply wasn't ready for it. It was a kind of a miserable experience for everyone involved because those that came were sorely disappointed in the Armenia that they encountered. And the folks that were here already couldn't understand why, at a time of famine, at a time of very desperate economic conditions post-war, why there were over 100,000 people being brought from outside to share the limited amount of resources that the country had. So as a result, well into the 80s, 90s, I think to this day, there was a lot of uh, um, conflict and misunderstanding between what they call the Tevatsis and the Akbars. Of course, if you, on the, it's, it's surface. Once you scratch the surface, there's nothing to it. But it happened. Um, we want to avoid that. Much better examples of Soviet repatriation were the repatriation of the Iranahais, which continued on through the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And that was done very well because uh, they were targeting um, the newly developing industrial areas. Harazdan, Chalet Savan, parts of Echmiatsi. Chansa and Razdan literally were created out of nothing, just to be industrial cities. And they brought a lot of labor from Iran. Uh, and uh, within a generation, those folks didn't think of themselves as far sky, they were just regular residences. And all of them too. So, while the goal is to create the preconditions where we can secure significant repatriation, in no way is the goal to eliminate the diaspora or, or in no way are we counting on bringing everyone back but uh, the strategic plan that the government is working on and it's still you know being fine-tuned it's not final uh, envisions a population of at least five million people by year 2050 which if you do the math backwards you, know, you cut out the first three four years because we're not simply not ready for that something like 40,000 to 40 to 50,000 people <coughs> Uh, repatriating per year and we simply need to be able to do it because there's no alternative um, one one item that I kind of skipped over and I think is important is the idea of the new diaspora uh, there is there is this thing called new diaspora and what it basically means is um, I think there's a dual meaning to it one is that the diaspora that's been created mostly from uh, individuals that left Armenia. Um, I think you can kind of add to it individuals that left from Azerbaijan, so the Bakvetsis and uh, Ganzavtsis, you know, um, as they call them. Um, those folks that left Jawak, and they don't belong to any organized community groups. They don't belong to church. I mean, they don't officially have their, you know, they go to church, but that doesn't mean that they're active in their church. They don't belong to traditional diaspora organizations because that concept is completely foreign to most of the Astansis or Jalapsis. Um, so that's sort of one category that's very large. Unfortunately, it's over a million people, maybe a couple of million, because over the last 30 years in Armenia and the surrounding areas have been bleeding Armenians um, to the diaspora. I think the second category is those diasporans that had uh, their own communities and had their organizations but have been displaced due to civil strife, for example, Syria, Iraq. I think you can add Iran to it as well because if 30 years ago the, pop the Armenian population of Iran counted at least 250,000 people, right now, realistically speaking, I think we have somewhere between 30 to 50,000. Iranian Armenians. So there's been major outflow from Iran. And uh, some of them have ended up in Armenia, but unfortunately most of them 
uh, ended up in the US. And we have to find a way to reach out to them as well. Because while it's easier to reach out and deal with uh, organizations because they, they're, they're collectives and they represent multiple individuals, so you're, it's more efficient to work that way. Like I said, there's a million, a couple of million people out in the diaspora that don't belong to these organizations. We must have access to them. We must work with them. We must find uh, some type of uh, method of interaction with them, yet we don't quite know how because, again, it's on an individual level. I think the concept of strengthening Armenia and making the concept of Armenian statehood attractive will somewhat solve that problem because people will flock to that idea by themselves as opposed to us having to complete, you know, constantly go and uh, propagate that idea. But it's going to take a lot of work. Um, in the next year, we have uh, we're projecting to have hold three conferences in the summer. One will be the uh, Hamahika Khan conference, one that has been done multiple times over the last uh, 30 years, but has been mostly lacking substance. We can't say that something tangible came out of any one of those conferences. The last conference that they held I was talking to someone, and I was an elected official in the United States, and someone asked me, said, oh, you're coming, right? I said, no, I'm not coming. I, first, I wasn't invited. I wouldn't be invited because I was always opposed to the old government, and I never uh, hid that fact. Second, I said, if I was invited, I wouldn't come because I'm not going to waste my time on something that is basically a PR project, has no meaning whatsoever. And the, the other person was a past from Armenia said, yeah, of course, complete BS. I know that. Eh, but I'm going to go anywhere. I'll just go and have a few meals and have a few drinks and come back. So those were, in essence, the diaspora and uh, the Hamaika uh, conferences. We are going to have a solid agenda with one key issue on that agenda. There will be other minor issues, but one key issue, which is how do we form a representative diaspora body that is going to give a voice to the diaspora and give us one partner to deal with. Um, and that's a very complicated issue, as you may imagine, because in the diaspora, many people are propagating this idea of one person, one vote. You know, if we're a citizen, we're, we should be allowed to vote. And I think that idea is fraught with danger and national security threats because, simply put, we have a diaspora that's twice the size of the population of Armenia. If we reach that idealistic, you know, ideal condition of having such a great country where every diaspora wants to take up citizenship and starts voting in our elections, we could have foreign nationals basically imposing their political will on people that live here, reside here, will have to suffer the consequences of those decisions. That just can't be. Large states can allow themselves that luxury. For example, Italy allows for that. They have a robust diaspora ministry, or whatever agency they call it, and they allow their diasporans to actually vote, to become citizens wherever they live, you know, in Italian, Argentina, and the United States, and, and everywhere else. And, they can vote in Italian elections. They have their representatives in the Italian parliament. But we're talking about a country that has, what's the population of like 40 million people, 50 million people? So they can, they can allow to have a couple of deputies that are elected by their diaspora. Israel, again, a better comparison to Armenia, a country that's relatively uh, sparsely populated. I mean, you know, I mean, it doesn't have a large, huge population. Yet Israel is a much more um, sophisticated state. It's a wealthy state. It's an organized state. And yet it doesn't allow its, its own citizens that are not physically located in Israel to vote in Israeli elections. I think, for me, that means a lot. Um, for me, that validates my... Not, this, is just, just, this isn't just me. I think the, the political leadership in Armenia right now is of this mind that we can't... So we can't afford to allow that kind of uh, luxury to ourselves. But that, the story doesn't end there, right? Okay, so we can't do that. What can we do? What tool can we give the diaspora to feel represented 
Um, and the answer to that question, we don't want to impose on the diaspora. We want the diaspora to actually tell us what they think the options are. And the purpose of that conference, I believe, will be largely to come to some type of consensus about um, this body that may be part of the parliament, yet won't have veto or voting power, or it can be an independent council that has an advisory role to the Republic of Armenia. And I assure you, if we, have, we find the right methodology to choose the members of this council, or whatever it's called, they will have legitimacy. They will have a lot of legitimacy, and their voice will be very important, have a lot of weight. I can't imagine a legitimately elected or appointed, again, I don't know what that mechanism is right now, but I can't imagine a body like that to be ignored by the Republic of Armenia and its government because it will carry a lot of moral weight. So that's an important issue that we look forward to discussing with our brethren from, uh, and our sisters from the diaspora. Um, the second conference that we intend to have is an economic diaspora economic conference. I think that's very important. The third one that we are going to have hold is going to be uh, a conference of all uh, elected officials in the diaspora. Uh, high-ranking governmental officials, and also um, lobbying groups. So we want, them, we want to bring all of them together for them to know each other, for us to know them, and perhaps talk about some serious issues that impact all of us. That's probably all I have right now. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Mr. Mokichan. Thank you, your Sinanian, for interesting and updated uh, speech. Let's open our Q&A session. If you have questions, you're welcome. Sad center. Uh, so, before my question, just would like to to check. Uh, could you say uh, what do you mean if you say small state? Do you mean uh, Republic of Armenia? And then, if you say global nation, uh, do you mean uh, all Armenians living abroad? I mean uh, outside uh, Republic of Armenia. Thank you. Uh, sure. Yeah, so small state means Armenia. Okay. So I'm not going to say Republic of Armenia because I say Republic of Armenia. So I'm going to say, well, you're excluding Artsakh. Armenia. Armenia today is all of Armenia, including Artsakh and the liberated territories. So yes, um, global nation is all of us. Yes, all of us. Those that reside in Armenia and those that don't. And I don't purport to identify people with Armenian names that don't feel Armenian as Armenians. Armenians are those that think they're Armenian or at least suspect that they're Armenian or have modicum of interest in being Armenian. So we are a global nation. We are people that are spread out throughout the world. And while our, small, our, our, our homeland is small right now, as a nation, we're global. We're everywhere. And we're involved in everything. Wherever we are, we're integrated. We're uh, part of that society. And in that sense, we're a global nation. So you mean a small state? You mean, uh, uh, you mean Armenia, Re Republic of Armenia? No. Any other no, I think I just answered that question. Right? No. Mm -hmm. no. Small state, you, you, you know, I, I, I mean, I answered the question. I can repeat what I just said. Okay. You cannot define. Okay. So no, no, I defined it. I defined it perfectly. <laughs> the state of Armenia, for me, is Armenia, which means Armenia, Artsakh, the very territories. Armenia. Well, I, what is it that you want me to say? Ask me and I'll tell you. So, Republic of Armenia and Artsakh. And liberated territories. Okay. I understand, but thank you. Now my question. Uh, you know, uh, first, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but you know, I would like to share some uh, criticism about the core idea uh, uh, in your concept. Look, you, you say about concept of small state, global nation. Like, in, in my point of view, so I guess something is missing here. So, in my point of view, like I said it maybe a while ago, that small state, big Banuran or big ironic and then global nation. I mean we miss here something historically like it was really a big and that is why uh, uh, It's a kind of um, uh, Something that we have to define better 
recently I was talking with some uh, Armenians living in uh, Western Armenia, Eastern Armenia, so now you know that's uh, uh, Turkey. They say we are not diaspora, we live in our own land. Uh, that is why my question is about if you say diaspora, so do you, uh, do you think about uh, any assistance or any including the, uh, also Armenians living in, uh, in what now is, it, now is uh, Turkey? Okay, so is it? I, I like the last part because you actually asked the question. Why don't we start with that? Does the Armenian nation include Armenians that live in Turkey? Right? So, yes, I do. But let me, let, let's see what we're talking about here, right? You may have your own idea of who Armenians are that live in Turkey. For me, I'll tell you who the Armenians are who live in Turkey. Any, any person who lives in Turkey, I don't care where they live, if they know, and I think I, you know, I kind of said like they're cognizant about their Armenian identity, so I'll, I'll say it again. Any Armenian, any person, any person that knows about their Armenian ethnicity and has a modicum of interest in being Armenian, for me, is Armenian. That you can define however you want. The Armenian in Hongshan who speaks that strange language and doesn't doesn't want to have anything to do with Armenians and doesn't want to admit that it's actually a, a very simple Armenian dialect, is not Armenian. But the same Armenian in Hongshan who speaks yeah. that dialect and knows that it's Armenian, he's Armenian and, and he wants to be Armenian. I, I, I know many of them, believe me, I meet with them, they come and visit us. Or an Armenian that lives in, uh, what do they call it now, Dersin or Sasun or Mush. A Zaza Kurd, who says, you know what, no, I know that I'm Armenian. He's Armenian. If he self-identifies as Armenian, he's Armenian. But these are two different things. You're saying that they're not diaspora. Sure, but they're not the state either. Mm -hmm. They don't live in a geographic area that's controlled by the Republic of Armenia. You could have started that argument with the Jabak Armenians. They don't, they're not a diaspora. Mm -hmm. They're not, they don't believe so. And therefore, but they're not part of a state. And that's the problem. They're part of our nation. So maybe you can say we should have a, also, a, well, we have a nation. We're a global nation. And those Armenians that reside in the territory of the Republic of Georgia are citizens of the Republic of Georgia. And that's something we can't ignore. Those Armenians that reside in, in Turkey are citizens of the Republic of Turkey. And that's a fact. Bosa Hayes, whose son I am, my uncle is here right now from Boris, they abhor the concept of being considered diasporans. And I understand that, I respect it. The fact is they don't reside in the Republic of Armenia. They're part of our nation. They don't want to call themselves diaspora, fine. The word diaspora isn't going really to use there. So, so well, and then, uh what if you uh, say not Armenians living uh, outside uh, uh, Armenia or Armenian uh, Republic and Artsakh and that, but Armenians living outside their uh, Benora, their Ironic, I, you know, I, including uh, other, other things too? I'm not disagreeing with you, but nothing there contradicts what you're saying. Nothing there. We'll organize another conference <laughs> for that concept. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, thank you. Please. Good evening. Good evening. Sarah Mahunyan, first year student at a program of political science and international affairs. Um, first of all, Mr. Zara Sinanian, thank you for your interesting speech. And my question is. My question is, which are the major challenges? that the Armenian diaspora is facing with nowadays, which are the problems that Armenians have in their communities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the challenges are, are numerous. Uh, the major challenge, of course, is assimilation. It's happening at different rates in different countries. It happens in different ways in different countries, but it's happening almost everywhere. It happens in the best organized communities, it happens in the worst organized communities. Usually, the better organized the community, the slower the rate of assimilation. 
And with that assimilation, you can associate every other problem that they have, right? I, there's a causal relationship between one and the other. Um, there's loss of interest in speaking Armenian. The youth overall in the diaspora doesn't want to speak Armenian. Again, in some places it's better, in some places it's worse, but that's a fact. Uh, people talk about Russia and they're saying, oh, they don't speak, you know, their kids, they go and two years later, their kids don't speak Armenian. Okay, in the U.S., they go and after 30 years, their kids don't want to speak Armenian. But bottom line is, again, you, if you don't, if you create a vacuum, uh, if, if there's nothing to strive towards, there's nothing to identify with that's healthy and strong and forward thinking, no, why, why bother speak Armenian? Because the pressures to speak the language of, of the place that you're at are huge. Uh, you have to supplement those pressures, I mean, you have to counteract those pressures with your own kind of solutions, and we haven't offered any solutions to the diaspora. But simulation is happening first and foremost, again, because of the lack of attention and care and direction that Armenia has given to the diaspora. You know, it's interesting, in a lot of places, and, and I saw this in Russia a lot, I even saw this in Cyprus, folks are saying, you know, we have a lot of problems, we have a lot of um, disagreements, the community is broken into pieces, they're basically fighting each other, and you need to come here, you, the Republic of Armenia, come here and set things right set things in order, put everyone in their place, settle our issues. Okay, well, think of the pro how problematic that approach would be, right? You go to a sovereign country, a country that's already very, you know, suspicious of a lot of things, and you go there as a foreign official, and you start dealing with their citizens, and telling their citizens how to organize themselves, and how to behave, and who should do what to whom. It just can't be done. What can and should be done is give direction, give advice, give common ideology, give um, a common goal to strive towards. And I think those, play, you know, those problems will, uh, they probably won't disappear, but they'll certainly become minimized. And that's what we've, we've failed to do in the past, and I hope we do that in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, um, Mr. Sinan. Well, I'm Dermat Hevosian, Professor Aresha, and Sinan Sorry for that. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, so I have. Um, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, so I have two questions and one suggestion, yes, if I may. Mm. So the first question is um, about the, the question of West, uh, Western Armenians. Sorry. I did that. So the question is about the Western Armenian. Um, how uh, have you thought about this? What to do with this um, language um, issue? How to preserve that language? And um, about inventing something that is being used, let's say, in Norway, of having two languages coexisting with, uh, next uh, to each other. So what is your approach? Have you thought about this? And the second is, uh, what are the current problems of your office that you are leading? What are the challenges that you are facing? And the third question is very much a suggestion related to that one. So I want to offer the help of our um, university and our program. We have um, uh, Tupanjan Center for Policy Analysis, um, and who each has a um, legacy and a huge tradition of policy research. So please count on us uh, when you need help when doing research, because uh, three years ago we did conduct a research in uh, Russia about the Armenian uh, diaspora and the problems that the Armenian diaspora in Russia has been facing. The research uh, was published in Journal of Diaspora Studies, one of the prestigious journals in the field. So this is something uh, to, um, to consider. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So um, the first question is a really tough one. So clearly, we have a crisis with Western Armenia uh, in that it, it's a dying language, no doubt about it. Because while we have an assimilation, 
going on in Russia, and that's a uh, simulation mostly of people that speak uh, Eastern Armenian dialect or some type of Eastern Armenian dialect. In the West, the, when folks don't speak Armenian, that means they're not speaking Western Armenian. Well, with the demise of our uh, Middle Eastern communities, Syria, Iraq, Iran is in huge decline, Lebanon is in decline, um, all the other countries have relatively smaller communities. You're, you're basically losing the only descendants of genocide survivors from mostly Western Armenians, and with them you're losing the language. It's a huge problem. Um, a third type, a third kind of a sort of a compromised language, it's interesting, I haven't heard about that, kind of an Armenian Esperanto. I, I don't know if it's something we can do, I don't know that we're ready for it, I don't know that we have sort of the resources for it. It's an interesting concept. I think what we should concentrate on is preserving Western Armenia, uh, preserving it what, in the Republic of Armenia by putting more resources to, to its, towards its preservation and figuring out creative ways of um, you know, studying it more or, or teaching more. Again, I'm, if, if Israel was able to revive the Hebrew language out of ashes, I mean, we can certainly do that in Western Armenia. Uh, but also using perhaps other institutions that are there but underutilized and, and present huge potential. For example, the Melkonian um, School in Cyprus. Right now, the, the building is still there, but it's not being used for anything. Well, why not turn it into place where Western Armenian is being properly taught to children and encourage, again, encourage children to, to go to this wonderful boarding school on, on a wonderful island and learn Western Armenian um, and maybe have some kind of scientific institute there as well that defines and works on Western Armenian. So a really tough one, I, you know, it's, it's, a, I think it's a problem that we need to tackle all of us, our whole nation. I think there's something more than merely practicality associated with the use of the Western Armenian language. The Western Armenian languages that are direct link to Western Armenian, something that we've, we've lost. And by losing the language that was spoken on that, in that part of our homeland, I think is a moral, uh, you know, it's a concession. You, you're conceding to yourself that you're okay with that loss. You're, you're giving up the last link to that land. I, I'm not ready to do that. I hope Armenian people aren't either. Uh, the second issue of the problems of the office, the, our, our office is having the same problems that every governmental entity is having in Armenia. Basically, the existence of a very faulty, I call it the anti-system. It's a system that's meant not to function. It was put in place so that things wouldn't get done. Because at the end of the day, when things don't get done, there's one way to get things done, is by a bribe, through corruption. Well, thankfully, there's no corruption in this country right now. So things don't get done a lot of the time. It's a problem, because folks don't know how to problem solve. They don't know how to get things done. Especially coming from a society where it's all about, it's sort of, you know, get things done, just do it fast. The problem, for every problem, there's a solution. Here, uh, in every solution, is looking for a problem. Uh, people love putting up road barriers. They love saying no. Why? Because it's the easiest thing to do. It requires no intellect. It requires no effort. It requires no patience, no time. And people default to it, unfortunately. So there's a cultural problem that needs to change. And you know, hopefully, we can be part of that solution, bringing change to that system. So systemic change that's impacting everyone's impact our country. Um, the offer of help, I'm greatly appreciative. We'd love to use any resource that you have, any analytical work that you've had, anything that you're willing to work with us in the future. We're basically going to partner up with every entity that is either academic or practical that is in that field of diaspora relation with diaspora studies. Just yesterday we signed our first MOU. We're working together with Ricard Armenia. We're going to sign one with uh, Birthright Armenia. We're going to sign 
with every entity that has to work on diaspora, diaspora issues and AUAs and uh, awesome you know, academic institution that we love to work with. So yes, by all means, please help us. I think that, that was it. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Sinanian, thank you very much for a wonderful, inspiring lecture. And uh, yes, personally, I was delighted when I heard about your appointment. So there are many people who have quite uh, high expectations of you. Uh, I guess we met before a couple of times. Yes, you me in yes thank you. Sir, thank, you. thank you, Betty. Uh, so uh, I will make just uh, three very brief comments and that also are some, to some extent, questions. Uh, the first one is uh, with the uh, issue that probably I even wouldn't have spoken if it wasn't brought up, uh, the issue of Banora. Because here conceptually, what I see a very clear, uh, the central point is a uh, political conceptualization of the issue. The issue of the Banora, as it stands today, it's an issue of uh, historical knowledge, and cultural issue. So, uh, and I will illustrate just how specific is this issue by one simple example here from AUA. In the course of these uh, five years that I am very happy to teach here and being back here, I had two students. I had about uh, four or five students from Turkey. Among those two uh, were uh, from Turkey of uh, Armenian descent. One was of Armenian descent, the other was of mixed Turkish-Armenian uh, descent. And they were very much excited about their ancestry, about the importance of Armenians, that they need to uh, learn the Armenian language. They want the knowledge they want a lot of, um, to know a lot about the Armenian culture, what is Armenia today, but why I'm pointing at those two, because those two both stated to me. But you know that at the same time we are proud Turks. We are very proud of our great Turkish nation. So this only is uh, the case why I'm bringing it up. That actually it's about the complexity of issues that uh, you are facing. And so uh, when uh, people are coming forward and uh, saying, oh, where is the Benoran, where it's over, we need to define what, where, where, what the concept of Benoran may, m meant, let's say, in uh, 1915, or it, it means now, and so on. It's all in the process of change and uh, development. So personally, I very much welcome your this uh, uh, aspect. And I, I know that you are not discarding, let's say, the cultural aspect, because for us, I think, and this is, I'm uh, making the, my second point, what is extremely important is to make Armenians very much aware and identify themselves with the Armenian culture, wherever it is. And it means that especially uh, the government, especially both uh, in uh, your office and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs probably needs to have us develop gradually a strategy, again, with our intellectuals. How to address the issues of Armenian heritage, cultural heritage, globally, worldwide. Because by like stressing that heritage, it will also help to preserve the Armenian identity. And the third thing I would say that I would also very much uh, uh, concur with Professor Termate Bosian, that uh, uh, we have here a, a very, very bad situation that is very little discussed in Armenia with regard to governance. Governance at different levels. Because we totally forgot about a very central concept, the concept of meritocracy. So this is the concept. Uh, which I translate in Armenian as Basta Kavarutu. The concept that needs to be reinvigorated and stressed because uh, people who already have demonstrated that they have some merit, they will also be 
have vested interest in the successful solution of uh, matters. And uh, there are different methods uh, how we can move in that uh, direction. So, in any case, please, I'm going to second Professor Thelma uh, rely on our help as much as we can. We are ready here to help you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Alishan. I'll just um, do you one better on your example of the proud Armenian who's a proud Turk. Um, I actually know a person, Hong uh, Shenai, who is fully aware of his Armenianness and speaks the they call the dialect, and is a member of the Grey Wolves. <laughs> yeah, I mean, talk about, uh, is that schizophrenia? I mean, it's some kind of a condition, but this is reality. This, this does exist. Folks who are, um, they know they're Armenian, but they're, they don't want to give up their Turkish identity. And how do you deal with that? And is that person Armenian or Turkish or what are they? So it's a complicated issue, you're, you're correct. I will tell you though that our government is interested in understanding the full scope of the Armenian presence in today's Republic of Armenia, its depth, its nature, and the opportunities or the problems that it presents. In terms of meritocracy, I think you said everything about meritocracy. The alternative to that is nepotism and cronyism, and look at where it's got us. Please, sit down, Shudwe, your question. Thank you for sharing your vision with us. And I have a question. You told that uh, your office now are interested in uh, doing research for mapping uh, Armenian diaspora. If there is some uh, steps you are doing on this di towards this direction, please, uh, can you give some more inform information about this? And I have a second question I should give later. Uh, yeah, um, sorry, I, I, sorry, I, I, you know yeah. about the survey, diaspora, uh, survey, diaspora, you know about there's this? Some, some there's one, there was one just a month ago that I think yeah, and the what key media was doing, or the ARF was doing. And no, Seven. no, the, 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 the next one, which is done by uh, Dr. Chilingarian, with direct. Yes, I know that one. Okay, so and your reflection on this survey, if you have I, some information. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first question is you know, I, I can't talk too much about it because we're, we're doing this project with the National Security Agency. So. <laughs> Okay. Uh, the second one, uh, you know, I, the, the volume of data and information that I'm processing and the number of people that I'm dealing with is such that I don't quite remember what I ate yesterday, let alone remember Chimingayan's survey. So I would have to take a look at it before I answer your question. So I apologize. I, can't, okay. I don't remember. Okay. Uh, and then the uh, next question is about uh, the diaspora Armenian archives. You know that there is a lot of archives and um, um, some scholars like me, when we are doing uh, studies on diaspora, different uh, topics about diaspora uh, life, um, these archives are not uh, accessible for all of scholars, uh, even in diaspora. Have you Based on what? What's, what's um, the excuse or justification? Uh, Sometimes they are they have no uh, resources uh, to get uh, get us uh, materials. For example, um, sometimes uh, due to political political issues or parties. Yes. <laughs> and uh, have you any any uh, I don't know vision on this direction? To work with archives because uh, the next, um, uh, I think that it's very important to have studies not on, uh, not only applied studies um, in diaspora, uh, but also theoretical studies on diaspora. And it's important uh, to have this kind of uh, studies. But uh, when archives are not accessible, it's uh, great. I think the best way to overcome that problem would be to digitize those archives. Yes, why not? Why that? not? Yeah, why not? No, 
resources. But uh, once you digitize it, once it's up in the, uh, in the sphere or the cloud, whatever it is, um, then it's harder to refuse access. I mean, there may be a fee associated with it. I don't know. But um, then it doesn't make sense not to allow people to use it. These are just regular archives, right? I assume they're not confidential archives. They're not, you know, there's nothing secret about them. So people do it because of whatever reasons they have. It's whimsical. It's just they just don't feel like doing it. If you digitize it, I think there's less opportunity for that type of um, uh, whimsical approach to these issues. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I just made that up. So, uh, but, but honestly, I think digitization helps a lot. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dear Sinanian, last, uh, <laughs> I want to use my opportunity to ask a question. Sorry. Uh, so, just a quick remark on the global nation. Global nation, uh, it's not only about the Armenians living outside of Armenia. It's about the relations, forces, institutions. It's also about the ideas, values generated in Armenia and widespread throughout the world. So, this is the concept which we want to discuss, to question, to challenge, to understand that we can apply these concepts to study Armenia as a small state. So, uh, in history during the early modern age, for example, uh, we had a chapter when Armenians controlled the largest part of the trade through the Armenian trade networks. And for example, the biggest trade company of the world, English East Indian Company, signed trade agreement, not the state, but the nation. And in the agreement it's put, agreement, trade agreement with the Armenian nation. This is one of the historical indicators that we were global nation. So now my question, what kind of opportunities, challenges, do we have what kind of uh, I don't know phenomena we can use to make Armenians global again, and also uh, in uh, small state theory there is a concept shelter, shelter which needs small state in order to overcome different challenges to compensate its smallness in international system. For example, can we consider Armenian diaspora as a societal shelter to compensate our smallness internationally. Thank you. Uh, by all means, I mean, we can consider our global nation or our diaspora as the only compensator that we have for our geographic location, for our size, for a uh, particular set of neighbors that we have. It's the equalizer. The only thing we do, I mean, there's nothing else. And unless and until we create a, a state that's so powerful and economically so developed and technologically uh, so innovative and, and creative and, and strong that we can uh, nullify or at least uh, ease the uh, threats that are posed by these negative factors, our global nation is the only resource that helps us you know, find some kind of uh, solace in the situation that we're in. Okay, thank you. And the very last question, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. there, was, there was someone. <laughs> I did it on six. Um, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Zadeh. Uh, my name is Rubina, so I have a lot of questions, but I'll ask only two of them. Um, so, High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs of the Republic of Armenia, or it also includes Arta? Uh, <laughs> you have to go there. Okay. Um, I'll tell you honestly. Do they have one, I mean? No. No. In, you know, I think of myself as for Armenia, and I already defined Armenia for you. So. You have to remember, and I'm saying this publicly and I've said it on many occasions, the creation of the two-state arrangement is a fiction that we created for the outside world. Yeah. We did not create that to fool ourselves. But in the last 20 years, that fiction was given so much prominence that we have come to fool ourselves with it. Folks, we are bound by law. The December 1st, 1989 session of the 
Gerardin Horuth of the Soviet Socialist Republic of Armenia unified those two parts together. And I'm not aware of any law that contradicts it, that has been passed, that does away with it. So when you ask that question, I, I, you know, you're asking an Armenian that question in an Armenian audience. And I'll tell you, we are one state. Yeah, of course. I was. Administratively, it doesn't make sense to have a separate, because again, you'll be, you'll be dealing with an Armenian audience, the diaspora, they're still <coughs> Armenian. By the way, same problem is much worse in the diaspora. Over there, the idea of, you know, Republics of Armenia and Republic of Artsakh is, I mean, too much. Again, we're forgetting why that was done. That was not the plan. When people got, you know, got up and, and decided they're going to invest the physical being in, in the unification of Armenia and Artsakh, they did it for unification of Armenia and Artsakh not to create two republics. Of course, why I ask it is, Artak is one of the regions of Armenia, yeah, but uh, what else, uh, why I By ask... By the way, the budget, <laughs> I mean, you realize that, right? Yeah, so so you collaborate with the Artak of officials. Course. Uh -huh. Okay, of course. so uh, why I ask this is, uh, during the recent pilgrimage organized by the Armenian Church Youth Union, um, we met with Bako Sahakyan, mm -hmm. and uh, one of the questions that uh, we asked was the following. Um, uh, what should the youth uh, uh, do to help Artsakh, like pract in practical means? So he he talked about the statistics, the population density statistics, comparing uh, in different cities in the world, like uh, this much people per square kilometer, etc. And he said it's very low in Artsakh. And he said the biggest issue for Artsakh is the population density. So um, you talked about repatriation. Uh, what do you think the practical steps are, uh, including repatriation to region Artsakh? Okay, right. thank you. Um, so I already talked about education, I talked about health care, I talked about uh, free economy. Um, you know, you can add on to that some kind of a governmental program that provides for integration, and that would probably include uh, language courses. So uh, folks are going to be coming back from in rural areas, more likely they'll come from Russia. I mean, they're going to have serious problems bringing people from Paris to live in Karvachar. So most likely Russia. They come from Russia. Their kids probably didn't speak Armenian. So yeah, some of them may not even be able to speak Armenian. So you have to teach them Armenian. Again, I'm not like coming up with this. This is what Israel does. Language courses jobs and residence. Those, these are three basic things that if you provide, most people will do the rest. And again, if it's in a, in a healthy economic environment, a place where you're not going to be um, you know, pressured or your business is not going to be taken away from you, there's going to be enough economic activity to provide for jobs. But before bringing large numbers of people in, you have to make sure these people are going to have jobs. You know, otherwise you're going to get 1946 where you bring people in. Then we'll... Okay, thank you, uh, dear Sinania. If there are still questions, please let's uh, join and ask questions after the offshore part. I want to conclude this interesting discussion using the words of the patriarch of diaspora studies, Kachik Tologa. Some never said in the Armenian diaspora. Thank you.